Be a part of the best pro wrestling podcast today by supporting the Going In Raw Patreon. You can enjoy access to the live taping of the show, exclusive merchandise, and patron-only episodes, and so much more. Support Going In Raw today. Click the link in the description. Hey, friendo, Steve here. And Larson. So yesterday, we looked at the best pro wrestling returns, spurred by the imminent return of Paige, John Cena's recent return, and to a lesser extent, all red everything, Eva Marie. Who some would qualify as a worst return. Exactly, Larson. That's why we decided to count down the worst pro wrestling returns ever. Undertaker! Ha! Yeah! Mark Calloway's American Badass character landed in the 10 spot on our best returns list, too. Basically, thanks to me. I have no qualms in saying I love the bandana. I love the bike. I even loved Limp Biscuit's music being used for his theme song, even though I hated Limp Biscuit. It was all trash, Steve. All of it. He was a supernatural being imbued with the powers of the darkness, not some dollar store motorcycle enthusiast. Okay, but you have to admit, his last ride powerbomb, which if I recall correctly, he only used as the American Badass, was really cool. No, he used it after the American Badass, and it was okay. But all powerbombs are great, except sit-down powerbombs, which are just kind of okay. Yeah. And on top of that, I was always afraid Undertaker's old knees were gonna give out when he did the last ride. So no, I guess it wasn't that great. It was just above sit-down powerbomb. <laughs> really? He what else is just above sit-down powerbomb? Regular power bombs above uh, last ride, <laughs> and then pop up power bomb is the top because oh, it seems like top, yeah. like the person giving it has to exert himself the least. Yeah. Batista, Batista's return to the WWE at the Royal Rumble in 2014 came at the exact wrong time. The company had woefully underestimated the fan support behind Daniel Bryan and excluded Bryan from the Rumble match itself, robbing the fans of a chance to see their favorite B plus player fight for a title shot at Mania. They focused their displeasure towards Batista once it came down to him, CM Punk, Sheamus, and Roman Reigns. Okay, now just stop for a second and think. CM Punk was basically on the same level fan-wise as Daniel Bryan. Had they simply booked CM Punk to win the Rumble, history would have been completely changed. Punk would be guaranteed a shot at the title at Mania, the crowd would have been hot for it, and Batista still could have been booked strong, given a high spot on the Mania card, maybe with a match against the game himself. Instead, this was the last time we ever got to see Punk wrestle, as he walked out the next day and began a two-year journey to play pretend as an MMA fighter. And Batista, who won the Rumble, instantly drew X-Pac heat for not being Daniel Bryan. His return was sabotaged from the get-go, and his run was short-lived, just long enough to reform Evolution and put over Daniel Bryan in one of the best stories wrestling has seen in the past few years at WrestleMania 30. And it's highly doubtful we'll see Dave in a WWE ring again anytime soon, Yeah, because he pretty much has said so. He pretty much said that, yeah, it's not gonna happen. Marty Jannetty! Poor Marty. First he was super kick partied through a fake set window, then had to watch his former partner Shawn Michaels go on to become the greatest in-ring performer ever, while he toiled away in relative obscurity. The former rocker was invited to come back as part of a fantastic feud between Kurt Angle and HBK, but when Janetti showed up and put on a decent showing against Angle, he was signed on for longer. Great, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, not really. At this point, Marty had had like 15 years of opportunities to prove himself across various promotions, and although he had been working regularly during that time, the former rocker was always just seen as exactly that, a former rocker. So when HBK trotted him out to reunite the rockers, we all knew he was basically a prop for a feud between two legitimate legends. From all indications, the WWE really tried to keep Jannetty in the fold this time, signing him three times and firing him each time due to various personal issues, including the fact that he couldn't even travel at one point because of a court order preventing him from doing so. A shoot interview with Marty from 2013 revealed just how bad things are for him. It's a rambling, almost incoherent mess of a video from kayfabe commentaries and makes you think of pre-DDP yoga Jake the Snake. We wish him the best, hopefully. Maybe he can get the, in the accountability house. Scott Steiner! The Steiners had a short, uneventful run in the WWF for about a year in the early 90s, before they went to Japan and then back to WCW for the duration of the Monday Night Wars. And of course, Scott Steiner had his breakthrough singles run during those years, playing an insane sex machine character who was wildly unpredictable and wholly entertaining at the same time. He was one of WCW's biggest draws, so when the WWE bought WCW, it seemed only a matter of when, not if, Steiner would be brought in. Sadly, when Steiner was brought in, he was a shell of his former self, suffering from, among other things, drop foot. 
which is exactly as it sounds. You can't lift your foot right when you walk. And part of Steiner's appeal, his wild card personality, seemed out of place in a company that had actual structure, as opposed to the asylum WCW seemed to be. In short, Steiner needed a place where his wild personality would go unchecked. So his WWE return was short-lived and not fruitful. Thankfully, his run a few years later in TNA was more reflective of his WCW run, and he had healed up physically, so his feud with Samoa Joe was one of his more memorable ones. And TNA gave Steiner a lot of leeway when it came to promos, which made for some very entertaining programming. Who would have thought someone at TNA knew what they were doing? X-Pac! Sean Waltman, aka the 123 Kid, made waves in the WWF during his feud with Razor Ramon, and spent a good three years there until 1996, when he signed one of those sweet, sweet guaranteed WCW contracts and joined the NWO under the name Six. Because he was a sixth member of the NWO. Yeah. Not the most inventive name ever. No. But his time in WCW wasn't exactly fruitful. His presence in the NWO with fellow Click members Hall and Nash was part of the NWO's bloat problem. He was just a body to add to the group. He held the cruiserweight title for a few months in 1997 and was fired later that year via FedEx while nursing an injury at home. Waltman has said that was a power play by Eric Bischoff to keep Hall and Nash in check. So that led to his infamous return to the WWF, where he debuted as X-Pac as the latest member of the retooled Degeneration X. And while he received an okay pop from the post-mania crowd that night, they probably would have popped for anyone, given how over DX was at the time. I like how Triple H teased it too, saying, you turn to your friends, you turn to the click. At which point everybody in the crowd is probably thinking, oh cool, Hall and or Nash are returning to DX. And then, eh, it was X-Pac. And while X-Pac did manage to get over in some respect, he's by and large remembered for being the namesake of the term X-Pac Heat, which essentially means people don't want to see a particular wrestler, not because they did a great job as a heel, but just because they don't like him or her. To his credit, X-Pac did manage to survive some addiction problems during his post-WWE career, and is still wrestling on the indie circuit to a good deal of success. And he recently launched his own podcast through Podcast One, and it's not bad. The first episode had uh, Scott Hall as a guest. Whoa, he has a podcast? Yeah. Uh, where is it in iTunes rankings? Is he below or above uh, going in or off? I don't know. Where's my goddamn phone? I'll check. Check. Uh, he's below us. Nice. The Rock! How could we possibly put the most electrifying man in sports entertainment on here, you ask? How about because whenever he comes back, he seems to just interrupt shit and make it worse. Look, he's The Rock, one of the most iconic pro wrestling superstars of all time. But let's run down his most recent return, shall we? Okay, he came back to feud with John Cena in a once-in-a-lifetime match at Mania 28. Fair enough. Big moneymaker gave Cena to do something away from the WWE title. We'll live with that. That's okay. Then, after that feud, he came back to halt CM Punk's great 400-plus day reign as champion just so they could up the stakes for Rock Cena 2 at WrestleMania 29, killing all the momentum the Straight Edge Superstar had going into 2013. And instead of making more money off Punk by adding him to the Cena-Rock rematch, making it a triple threat, they instead just kept that match a twice in two years match, directly contradicting the once in a lifetime tagline from Mania the year before, just so Cena could win the title back and get his win in over The Rock. And then there was last year, when Rock came back to Mania, behaving as if someone had laced his protein shake with bath salts, lit his name on fire, and buried the shit out of the Wyatt family, as if WWE Creative doesn't do that enough already. Look, he's The Rock, he's money, he's box office. But at this point, he's just the drunk uncle who shows up at Thanksgiving and makes everyone uncomfortable. The WWE should take a cue from how they handled his WrestleMania 30 appearance with Stone Cold Steve Austin and Hulk Hogan, which was highly entertaining. I do like that flamethrower, though. Yeah, me too. They should, he should pass that on to somebody. Like, that's a literal torch passing. Lex Luger! The official going in Raw legacy wrestler Lex Luger had a successful run in the WCW in the early 90s, becoming its fake world champion after Ric Flair left for the WWF with the real WCW world title. That's actually true. When Lex beat Barry Windham for the WCW title in the wake of Flair leaving, they had to gussy up the NWA State's Western Heritage Belt to make it look like the real deal. NWA State's Western Heritage. That sounds like a credit union, not a wrestling title. I think my dad banks at NWA Western Heritage. 
Within a few years, Luger heard that Vince was starting a bodybuilding promotion, and Lex, sensing that the sport of bodybuilding would rival baseball's America's pastime, decided to be a good career move to join up with the WBF and transition over to the WWF from there. Which he did, and the Narcissist and Lex Express gimmicks were cemented in the annals of sports entertainment history. Once it became clear to Vince that Lex wasn't going to be replacing Hulk Hogan anytime soon, or ever, Lex went back to the WCW for less money than before. And history was made when Lex got lost in the Mall of America and found the show he was supposed to debut on was taping their first episode. It was called WCW Monday Night Nitro, and Lex wore a puffy shirt. Many argue that Lex Luger's debut on Nitro was the opening salvo in the Monday Night Wars. And that's okay, you can think that. But Lex's debut wasn't nearly the impactful, mysterious, and groundbreaking debut of, say, Hall and Nash, just because Lex hadn't really been used a lot in the WWF towards the end of his time there. And those two were hot when they left Vince. And in the end, he just kind of ended up being just another former WWF guy who got paid money to do not that much. Mm, not that much. That pretty much sums up Lex Luger. Not that much. Diesel! Before we get started with this one, let's be clear. We both love Kevin Nash. Maybe he wasn't the best booker, maybe he wasn't the best wrestler, but he was one of the first guys to seamlessly blend his real personality with his on-screen character. He revolutionized the style of performance that eventually gave birth to what was briefly called the reality era, where shoot and work sort of merged. The CM Punk pipe bomb kicked off the so-called era, which had obvious roots in Nash's NWO promos, which would often reference behind-the-scenes dealings and straight-off storyline to give the audience the idea that we were getting a glimpse behind the curtain. So, in short, we like Nash. So while it was kinda exciting to see him return at SummerSlam 2011 to destroy CM Punk, given the beating we knew Nash's knees had taken over the years, watching him deliver an admittedly impressive jackknife powerbomb to Punk was kinda hard to watch. According to Nash, an interview with PW Torch, right after his return, the WWE doctors found out he was on heart meds and de-cleared him to wrestle, which is why Triple H had to take over the angle and wrestle Punk instead. Which is all the same, Nash was 52 at the time. He shouldn't have been in an angle with the hottest guy in the company in the first place. Look at the adjective, Steve. Angle. <laughs> no, Nash, that's not an adjective, once again. Play. That's, again, a verb. Ultimate Warrior! You have to give it up to Vince McMahon for the number of times he was able to forgive the eccentric business practices of the Ultimate Warrior and bring him back to make more money off him. His second run to the company, after he was fired for staging a SummerSlam holdout in 1991 and then in 1992 for failing a drug test, happened in 1996 for a brief three-month run. He made his big return at WrestleMania 12, where he beat Triple H in less than two minutes, at one point no-selling the game's pedigree like it was absolutely nothing. That's a huge change from nowadays, since the pedigree is like the most powerfully booked move in all of wrestling. He only lasted a few months after that before he started no-showing events, which, according to him, was because the WWF was selling Warrior merchandise and not giving him a cut. Speaking of which, am I going to get a cut of those Heel Larson shirts we're going to start selling? Absolutely not. Really? I'm going to start no-selling this show then. Jeff Jarrett! Evidently, Jeff Jarrett was so confident in the abilities of Vince Russo to cure the ills that plagued WCW that he was willing to burn bridges with Vince McMahon over a few hundred thousand dollars and jump ship to the Atlanta promotion. So back in 1999, long after establishing that he couldn't draw a dime without a guitar or Deborah by his side, or even with a guitar and Deborah by his side, Jarrett decided to collude with Vince Russo to build the WWF out of some money. According to China's autobiography, the two worked his intercontinental title reign to end the day after Jarrett's contract ended at the No Mercy pay-per-view. Russo then left for WCW, and on the day of the No Mercy pay-per-view, Jarrett allegedly went to Vince McMahon and demanded $300,000 to drop the belt to China. Which he ended up doing. Jarrett's side of the story is that he simply demanded what was owed to him contractually, so who knows what's true? We're not claiming he actually did anything fishy, we're just saying what China said. What isn't up for debate is how little people gave a shit when he came back to WCW. We were watching at the time. Seriously, I can't even remember his actual return because nobody cared, except apparently for Vince Russo, who cared so much, he eventually put the big gold belt around Jarrett's waist. And what a waste it was. As in, waste of everyone's time, Jarrett's title reign or reigns, 
is the period of WCW we like to call the train wreck era, when Russo booked not just himself as champion, but also Jarrett and David Arquette. Not surprisingly, the company was bought out by Vince McMahon a few years later, and the closest Jeff Jarrett ever got to WWE programming after that was in the form of old USWA footage on the WWE Network, which is pretty much is up there now because some of Stone Cold's early work is there. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. So those are the worst pro wrestling returns we could think of. Let us know what we missed in the comments or what your thoughts are. And be sure to check out our best return video that we did yesterday. Yeah, it's the best.